recording. So for, for today, we uh, are having, uh, initially, we, we plan to have uh, three guests. Uh, uh, and uh, on purpose, by design, we invited uh, um, professionals with a diversity of viewpoints uh, um, covering different aspects uh, of the crypto industry, uh, financial and uh, banking aspects and trading aspects, but also legal aspects. And uh, by having uh, Gary Rogers with us, we wanted to uh, cover as uh, cultural aspects uh, as well. Um, so we have uh, with us today Ian Taylor, who is a banking professional and uh, he's the CEO of Crypto UK, the umbrella organization of uh, the crypto industry in the United Kingdom. And we have Lodewijk van Setten, who is the general counsel at Tezos Foundation. Um, before we start, I'm not going to to talk too much uh, now. I just uh, my plan was to start with a short recap of um, the timeline of events, uh, the collapse of uh, FTX, uh, and then uh, I have a couple of questions uh, for our guests. So, this being said, let me share my uh, screen with you. And uh, just to recap now, I hope that everyone can see the screen. Just to recap now, the main characters in our in our story are Sam Bankman Fried, uh, also known as SBF, a former trader for Jane Street and uh, the CEO of FTX, uh, um, an um, online trade uh, crypto exchange, which at the peak was the third largest by volume. And then we have Caroline, uh, Caroline Ellison, also a former trader for Jane Street and CEO of a hedge fund Alameda Research. Uh, that was actually the market making arm of FTX. And then uh, Changpeng Zhao, or CZ, um, the CEO of Binance, um, Another very well-known uh, online crypto exchange. And then we have other characters, uh, John J. Ray the third, uh, who was appointed uh, as the CEO after the bankruptcy, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the CFTC, the um, Bahamas Securities Commission, the Bahamian Police, Hong Kong investors, venture capital firms, and many more. I'm not going to insist now on that because the, the entire cast is, is rather long. Right, and um, I'm just going to focus on uh, 10 days in November, starting on November 2nd, when the balance sheet of Alameda Research was leaked. And then um, it was discovered that the reserves consisted mainly of the FTX own token, FTT, which FTX could print out of thin air, so to speak. And then four days later, CZ uh, tweeted that Binance will liquidate its FTT holdings, that's known to be at half a billion dollars. Then on November 7, CZ tweeted again that the FTT liquidation is only risk management, but he added that we won't support people who lobby against industry players behind their backs. Um, then, uh, as BF tweets, uh, FTX is fine, assets are fine on the same day. On November 8, Binance tweets a non-binding intention, intention to buy FTX. And on the 9th of November, Binance withdraws the non-binding offer, while on November 10th, Alameda Research stops trading. And on November 11th, FTX files for bankruptcy. So on November 12th, customer funds go missing, and on the morning of that day only, almost half a billion dollars are moved, were moved out of FTX wallets. And then it was discovered that sums much larger than that had gone astray. So, of course, we can extend this timeline of events easily. I wanted to keep it short and focus on the 10 days it's from November 2022 on, 
when all this happened. This being said, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and ask the panelists now. Let me let me start with the following question. I'm going to ask both Ian and Lodevic to address this uh, this question. Um, so Ian, first, uh, is this a failure of blockchain technology or is it Bernie Madoff 2.0? <laughs> Thank you. Alex, ever so much for inviting uh, me to speak today. And also um, just a quick um, piece of uh, uh, gratitude to all the good work that you and your colleagues at King's College London do for the industry. Um, yeah, well, a good question. Gosh, looking at that timeline, 10 days. 10 days is a long time in crypto. That was a lot happened uh, back in November. And to bring it all back um, into... Um, uh, in, into my head just sort of sends shivers down my spine because it was an absolutely insane period of time. Um, so to answer your question, no, this is not a failure of technology. Technology is agnostic, human interaction generally. Um, what we do know is, um, and there's lots of detail that we can dive into during this discussion, is just at a high level what we've seen with information released from law enforcement, information tweeted out from those um, inside the organization, and obviously lots of discussion on crypto Twitter, which um, isn't shy to give opinions um, either, either side of the argument, is that this was in its simplest form um, a failing at the highest level of um, basic governance, risk management, and any, any form of relevant um, process procedure to protect against this um, kind of enormous failing in terms of the monetary value we're talking about. Um, and, you know, this is at the very least fraud. And as we'll see when this comes to court later this year in the US, mm -hmm. perhaps there are some criminal um, activities that have taken place um, because there has a number of charges that are criminal charges brought against um, these individuals um, in the US. Some are pleading guilty, um, some are pleading not guilty to the, the charges um, that, that have been uh, laid out and the, you know, the main protagonist that you mentioned there. So, um, yeah, on that, I'll, I'll stop there and I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, Ludwig add his uh, views. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Ludovic, please. So same question to you. Is it a failure of blockchain technology or again, Bernie 2.0? And I, I'm assuming that all of us present here in this uh, seminar are familiar with Bernie Madoff's doings from what, 2008, 15 years ago. Well, that's where it ended. <laughs> I think he started somewhere in the 70s. Oh yeah, much uh, yeah, yeah. The um, uh, yes, no. I think we can all violently agree that it has nothing to do with blockchain technology. Um, is it Bernie Madoff? Um, uh, just to remind everyone what Bernie did, he was a very crafty man. Uh, that certainly has in common with uh, with our friend SBF. Um, very charismatic, and what Bernie did is um, he took his investors' money, um, and he did, did nothing with it, really. Um, he didn't invest it. He didn't, uh, he didn't do anything that he said he was doing with it. He, he controlled both the asset management, the brokerage, and the uh, custody of the, of, of the uh, asset management business that he said he, that he was carrying out. Uh, instead, he simply held the money in a pot and then he paid out uh, anybody who was redeeming uh, in accordance with the fictive, um, sorry, fictitious uh, returns that he, that he claimed he had made. So in that respect, he is, he is different from, from what happened here. Um, and, and I'm sorry if I'm uh, putting this in legal terms. Um, what happened here is someone who promised that you're, you own your, literally in the terms and conditions, you, you own uh, your deposits. They're entirely yours. You control them. Uh, and we shall not use them. And then he did 
completely the opposite. So he basically ignored the contractual provisions and took the money and lent it to a affiliate. Now there are many, many legal problems with that, as I think Ian has already said, at least there is fraud. Um, SBF will claim, oh, I, I didn't really know. And he, 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 he sort of, he sort of has a claim that he probably didn't quite know what was going on, except that because it was such a mess that, that he couldn't tell exactly what was going on. But he certainly knew that he was using customer funds where he had promised that he wouldn't. So in that respect, um, he's different from uh, Bernie um, because it's not a Ponzi scheme. It's just simple steal stealing in, uh, and using it for perhaps that he wasn't allowed to, to use it for. Um, also, interestingly, and this is where the furore gets kind of, a, kind, of, kind of mixed up, I think, blockchain and regulation. Bernie was regulated, right? The SEC would come around and all that what he was doing. Now, and he had a very elaborate system where he had even had fake custody accounts and so on and so forth. So he was, he was very good at it. Um, FTX wasn't regulated. So they made promises, they weren't regulated, and uh, therefore nobody was looking at what they were doing. And in that respect, it was also different from, uh, from Madoff. But we can all agree that it's not blockchain technology that went wrong here. Yeah. Thank you, Lodovic. Then um, le let me ask Ian now again. Ian, what, uh, um, as far as you can uh, estimate, what has been the impact uh, of this FTX scandal upon the industry so far? One word, seismic. Gosh, if I had a, a euro, a dollar, a pound for every conversation I've had since that uh, awful period in November where we've spoken about FTX and the impact it's having across uh, many aspects of the sector, I could retire now. Um, yeah, so naturally, let's talk first about regulation and policymakers. It's had, you know, it's woken many folks up in that arena um, as to um, what some would say is, is an industry that's, that's largely unregulated and is the Wild West. And perhaps these um, huge failings, and there's been others last year, um, give some credibility to that rhetoric, which is really unfor unfortunate for those individuals that are building um, new products and services on DLT and blockchain technology. Good example is, you know, real DeFi protocols that haven't wavered, haven't faulted because they are completely open source and all of the transactions and all of the activity takes place um, in a non-opaque, transparent fashion on a blockchain. That's the whole purpose of technology. So those of us that do the, the good work of educating and advocating policymakers find ourselves um, taking a step back um, in, in time and in terms of having to just reinforce the, you know, the positive rhetoric and message around the technology and get away from this human interaction. And, and you use the Madoff example, and, and, that, and that kind of fits to a degree because there probably will be proven some criminal activity. And, you know, Bernie, I, I believe he just put his hands up when, when the game was up post the financial crisis. <laughs> he couldn't hide it uh, any anymore and handed himself in, or his, or his you know, family did. Um, in this example here, many folks are saying this is Enron. So a corporate scandal of the highest order where criminal charges should and will be brought with, you know, really long prison sentences. So, yeah, um, in summary, everybody you speak to, those in the industry, those outside the industry, those in government, those in private sector, um, all see this and read about this because it's obviously a very big story. Um, and it, it either reinforces the negative rhetoric that crypto is, yeah, you know, not real, is used by criminals, is a yeah, Ponzi scheme, is just the you know, tulip uh, mania, um, whereas... Uh, that's very unfortunate because there is real, you know, interesting innovation taking place in many aspects. Thank you, Ian. Now, um, Lodovic, um, what are the legal implications as seen from the UK? The legal implications of this scandal, it didn't happen in the UK, but um, I'm assuming at least personally that there are some legal implications here. For sure. Um... It said that uh, um, 
in in law uh, um, heat uh, uh, bankruptcy does to uh, to your to your position what heat does in chemistry so it shows you what you really've got right that basically bankruptcy tests um, in any jurisdiction it's not special to a particular jurisdiction but it tests whether you own the assets or not if you if if you own it, you could go to the liquidator and say, give it back to me, I own it. Um, if the bankrupt or the uh, insolvent owns it, then it is in the estate. And then you just hope you have basically have a claim. And then you hope that if your claim is 400, that you get as much as much as 100 back, which you won't get because they're insolvent. And typically it's only 10. So you get 10, you get 10 cents on the dollar back. Um, so it matters um, whether you own it or not. And here, um, common law uh, is manifestly different from civil law. So uh, English law or the US and all the common law countries, Singapore, Australia, et cetera, et cetera, including the Bahamas, uh, have a common law system. And in common law, if you have a contract with someone who says, um, Thank you for that asset. I will look after it. Uh, it's yours and I will segregate it as basically was promised by FTX. Then in essence, you own the asset. So you can, you can, um, you can claim it back and you should be largely protected. Now, that's only true if uh, the circumstances um, are such that the, what's known as a trust can actually be imposed on the assets. And in that case, you need certainty of subject matter. Um, in this case, of course, the assets have been removed. <laughs> so, so although you get although you get a re, uh, you get a replacement because you now have a tracing claim on the person who owns the asset, but if the person who owns the assets has lost them, as Alabama, Alameda, I'm not even sure how to pronounce it. Um, um, has then then this 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 um, this claim that you have evaporates. Um, it makes um, uh, good sense to compare this to the Lehman insolvency, which people may recall in, in two thousand and eight, around the same time that Bernie threw up his hands. Um, um, there, the question was the same because the Lehman was sitting on an enormous pile of liquid assets. Uh, bonds, securities, cash. And the question was, um, you know, is a trust imposed so that you can claim these assets back as the owner rather than as a someone who just has a claim of return? Um, and the UK courts were very helpful. They said, yes, there were all sorts of questions again about certain subject matter I won't bore you all with. But they said, yes, and there's some meaningful um, uh, meaningful protection now in the UK without statutory inter intervention, as you see in the US. So that's all working well. Now, obviously, Lehman Brothers was regulated. And when a regulator looks at a corporate, um, it, it, it will look at its organization. It's known as prudential regulation. And it's not just have minimum capital. It's also about your systems and control. So a regulator would come in and say, ah, where are these assets and are you actually administering them in such a way that these proprietary rights are protected? Uh, but unfortunately, of course, FTX wasn't regulated and therefore nobody was looking at it. And you, you, even though you might claim you have a proprietary interest, it, it, it's not, it, the asset isn't there. So it's very difficult to, to, to go and, 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 and claim that back. So, uh, you know, it long and short of it is that this will be an almighty mess, not just because things have been taken and, and given to someone else and then the someone else has replaced them again and then lost them again and so on and so forth. So uh, this is going to take years and years <coughs> that if they even can find enough records to, to, even, to, even, to even figure out what's what, if that makes sense. Yeah, can I also ask a question, Rick, actually? You may have, well have been aware of a recent um, court uh, case with Celsius, which was a crypto lender 
where we saw in the US, and this is you know part of where the la lack of regulatory clarity regarding safeguarding of clients' assets um, is an issue um, in custody, that it was deemed, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the client assets that were lent to this centralized entity called Celsius was a crypto lending um, uh, market participant were not were, were allowed to be used in the assets of the bankruptcy therefore were the property of the um estate so to speak when it came to bankruptcy were not segregated for the clients in short client won't get their fund back yes no so there's two things that weren't on there mm -hmm. um again uh, the, uh, so from a legal perspective one is in Celsius, or, but, but will be true for FTX as well. The first question is because, in, of course, in order to own something, it needs to be property first in law. Uh, so the, the, there are all sorts of questions about um, if you have a token, uh, be it uh, an application token in a contract or a protocol token, do I have property? And um, the, the common law courts have very helpfully, because that's why common law is so flexible and commercial, if that's the word to say it, um, very helpfully said, oh, we don't, it's obviously property, but basically that's what they've got. And, then, and that's gone around the world, Singapore and the UK and uh, Australia and so on and so forth. Um, 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 so that is the first question, do I have property? And the answer is yes. Then the second question is, am I now transferring this property to you or not? Right, and so this comes back to this um, this um, this question uh, about what what was the relationship with FTX, and the terms and conditions clearly said we'll segregate this asset, we keep it as custodian, or words to that effect. That means you're not transferring the the, the property; you retain ownership. They're just looking after it, basically. Um, with Celsius, that was different. So the courts looked at the contract and said, "Well, hang on, a minute. this is a this is a deposit." in the form of a loan. So you're lending it to Celsius rather than giving it in custody, right? And if you lend some a fungible assets such as tokens to uh, another person, to a borrower, then the obligation of the borrower is to return to you the same amount of that particular fungible asset, but not the same asset, you see? And at that point, you sever your ownership rights. So that's it's, it's completely um, predictable. I mean, there's nothing spectacular about it in terms of, of legal, there's nothing new and legal about it. You know, it's just a court interpreting the relationship but say it's a loan. If that had been money or it had been securities or it had been any other fungible asset, that would have been the same outcome. Thank you very much, uh, Lodovic, for clarifying this. Um, I was, uh, let me add the following, uh, as far as I know, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, as far as I know, when you have a situation where an operator of an exchange platform, of a trading platform, works together with a market maker, the market maker should be segregated from the platform operator, uh, which in this case, uh, the FTX case, wasn't the case at all. Apparently, both on an uh, on an institutional or on the organizational level and on a personal level. And secondly, uh, we have this uh, principle of uh, separation of funds. Uh, so the uh, client's funds shouldn't be mixed up with the firm's funds. Uh, but in this case, in the FTX case, we had a uh, commingling of assets. Uh, FTX simply mixed clients' funds together with their own funds. Am I correct in stating this? That would be for each of you, Ian. And right, Bob. yeah. So, um, so uh, Ian, do you want to go first? Or? No, no, why don't you go first this time? Let's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it up a little yes. bit. <laughs> well, there's a guy. I uh, I love I love the mic, uh, and, and and then I talk about legal stuff, and, <laughs> and you know I just don't want to dominate with of the legal hearing. I know it's good um, to have a legal framework, then I'll sort of give a market view and a regulatory view. Yeah, sure, sure. So 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 yeah. So so this is known as conflict of interest 
right uh, in 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 the financial in the in the traditional financial world um you know and separation of duty and and interest is very important so that that the users can be sure that they're dealing with an independent vehicle so to take your first your first um uh, 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 situation where you, you get an exchange and the exchange then has liquidity that's made by a market maker, but the exchange owns the market maker. At that point, the exchange is not independent anymore in just what, what, a, what an exchange is supposed to do is offer the trading platform and, 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 and look at the market uh, integrity, basically, and keep and keep the uh, the settlement safe. So look at default risk, minimize the default risk, minimize market integrity risk, minimize security risks, all, all of that. So it's a it's a it, it's a very it's very a, a market infrastructure function, right? It's an administrative management function. As soon as you start mixing that with um, uh, with with trading, liquidity, market making, profits on 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 trades that come through. Um, you, you, you're compromising the exchange's primary job. So that, that would, shouldn't be. And again, this comes to, if, if there is a debate out there, it should be regulated. Of course, you should regulate it. If you have something that trades, at, well, something that is as liquid as these tokens, they become close to, uh, now, now I'm not going to say this is a security or anything like that. In fact, personally, side note, I think it's a commodity, but uh, you know, we can talk about that for half an hour. But um, so, back, so, no, you shouldn't allow that. Secondly, you definitely sh should have separation of assets, right? I mean, this again, it's, there's, there's as old as the world, right? In the sense that you, if, as a trustee, and that goes back to the 1600s, as a trustee, you have a very primary yeah. duty not to mix your own assets with the assets of, of your client. It's called fiduciary duty. And it, it's them, I think that the breaching that. FTX has been breaching that left, right, and on, but even without being regulated, that's just common law, if that makes sense. So, um, yeah, but bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I couldn't have put that any better. I was, you know, thinking this, um, you know, non-separation of functions and activities um, is it, just leads to abuse. Um, um, and market integrity is, is the key one. Um, and add into that the fact that, FTX was printing its own currency, its native exchange token, FTT, to fill the holes that were appearing in the trading shop and made a research due to all of the prior um, bankruptcies through other um, trading uh, operations, main one being Three Hours Capital and also some other uh, crypto firms were starting to feel the pain. Um, it was just a recipe for disaster. And, and, and for me, the simple thing is, um, and Ludwig you know, eloquently put it, this is why we have these separation of responsibilities. We've seen these things before, those of the works in uh, financial markets. That's why we have these regulations to protect against this type of risk, whether it be liquidity risk, credit risk, or, you know, integrity risk. Um, and so this particular operation, unfortunately, um, grew very, very fast. And when, you know, number goes up and the times are good, did very well. But guess what? That number will go down um, and wasn't able to be able to deal with that. And then you know, what, what I believe we'll see now um, after you know, many conversations with regulators and those in the industry looking to protect against, you know, significant harms that people would have felt both retail and institutional because of this, this failing and others is we will probably see a read across from traditional financial regulation into the crypto sector, specifically around protecting client assets. So custody regulation in the UK, we have a thing called CAS, client asset source, but that was rolled out post the last financial crisis. So that's what a lot of people in the sector are talking about and just finally I, I, I often liken this to if I'm going to go to the New York Stock, Stock Exchange and start trading you know Tesla shares or Apple shares just imagine if the New York Stock Exchange just started you know propriety trading with my assets <laughs> by itself you know that just doesn't make any sense at all does it in terms of front running in terms of manipulation and all these integrity uh, risks that that, that Ludwig mentioned Thank you. 
Thank you, Ian. So I just received news that Gail Rogers is uh, on his way to us, uh, namely on his uh, way to, to the laptop and uh, to Zoom. Uh, bear with me until he joins us. Uh, it was a matter of um, uh, EST versus GMT when it comes to 4 p.m. Um, but until he joins us, allow me to comment a little bit on, on the question uh, I had for him. Uh, so I wanted to ask Gail, uh, who has written a book about speculation, what are the cultural templates within which FTX has unfolded, the scandal has unfolded, and how far back can we trace this template? Simply because I believe if, you, if we follow the entire timeline be, uh, beyond these 10 days in November, there are some specific cultural templates uh, uh, there, at least in the media and on Twitter, the fact that uh, at some point uh, FTX was uh, celebrated, uh, sorry, SBF, uh, Sam Bankman Fried, uh, was celebrated as a kind of titan uh, of industry, as one of the uh, richest, uh, youngest uh, men around. Uh, he wasn't even 30 then and uh, was regularly appearing. Uh, on, on the cover of uh, several uh, various magazines uh, celebrated by the media for having found richness uh, uh, riches very quickly in uh, in the matter of you know just uh, three years or less than three years even that tells us something about the uh, about some cultural templates uh, at work here that have at least in part enabled um, you know the entire uh, operation. Um, if we go back in time and uh, look at the beginnings, we, we have this uh, uh, trader, professional trader, uh, employed, formerly employed by uh, James Street, uh, arriving in Hong Kong and uh, uh, starting uh, in 2019 and uh, starting uh, an uh, crypto exchange from scratch. Uh, and uh, looking for fonts. And this being said, since Gail is here with us, um, I will ask him to uh, take over. Mm -hmm. Gail, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Deepest apologies for the mix up. Uh, I, I take entire full responsibility for it. And uh, thank you very much for, for joining us in uh, this debate. And it was uh, in a certain oh, sense, yeah, right on cue because I was arriving at the question I wanted to ask you, namely, what are the cultural templates within which FTX has uh, the scandal has unfolded and how far back can we trace this temp these templates? Um, thank you, and um, my, my deepest apologies. The uh, uh, Outlook calendar is really to blame for uh, for the time zone uh, snafu here, which uh, I was ready to go at four Eastern today, and 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 here I am. So I'm I'm really sorry. sorry it's my fault. fault. Entirely my uh, fault. Sorry. Uh, so so thank you so much for the invitation. I've really been looking forward to this, and uh, really good to be here. So um, I thought a lot about this question. Um, we could take this back, you know, as far as easy, easy examples such as the uh, the tulip bubble, the the South Sea bubble, um, all the way up to modern examples such as the dot com bubble, uh, uh, or if you want to, you know, add in some more elements of of kind of obvious fraud such as like the Enron scandal, in which you know some of the same players are involved, obviously, right? Um, and so, I mean, like one of the main questions that comes to mind. In, in any of those examples would be, uh, you know, what is it that, uh, that was like the driving force there? And I think, I think you have to sort of uh, parse out that uh, in, in each of those instances, you had an underlying asset that was either new or had some sort of valuation to it that made it uh, new, that made it have a new purpose or a new some, something that was that was like a, not understood about it, right? And therefore had this possibly possibly inflationary value and speculative value to it. Whereas, say, um, crude oil at this point can go up, but probably will not go up ten thousand percent over a period of six months. That's so, over. Right? <laughs> we might be in trouble. So, um, so in each of those cases. Uh, what we saw 
was uh, betters making large bets, um, and we saw deceit, we saw fraud, et cetera. And, uh, and we saw like a pretty similar template of you know, insider plays um, once they saw that they could play upon uh, this unknown element about what is this thing and how high can it go? We don't really know. Um, whereas most people would not make those same sorts of plays on like uh, say Coca-Cola stock. Um, what's interesting to me too about the way that this episode has been framed and, I, and, and someone has probably already said this too is like, we learn new things about this every day. We're still far from understanding how, how uh, all the elements of this and how, how, how deep and complex it is, um, is that um, you, you talk about the cultural templates, uh, understanding um, uh, 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 speculative, uh, uh, um, episodes as manias or as frenzies is actually very new, historically speaking. It was only in about the 1780s or 1790s that they were called manias or frenzies or irrational episodes. Um, prior to that, they were understood as maybe foolish, maybe uh, uh, deceitful, um, but only with a kind of uh, connection of modern understandings of psychology, of gambling, uh, and um, uh, uh, crowd frenzies, did they get labeled as maniacal in some way? Uh, and so that's this is a common thing that we see now. Everything from calling the you know GameStop mania, you can pick your headline, whatever it's going to be. Um, and I'm sure if you pull up 15 articles about FTX, 10 of them are going to say that the betters were maniacal. The question I always ask there is, were they? Were they really maniacal, or were they, you know? people who were trusting what FTX offered as a platform and making bets, uh, just like investors in Robinhood make bets on the stock exchange. Investors in Fidelity make bets on the stock exchange, just doing it in a different form. Um, how crazy is it versus the crazy or not crazy plays that you know, derivative traders make every day? So um, I think it's a fair question to ask, especially when we think about um, how known or unknown are the underlying assets that are being at play here. So those are kind of the, the my sort of historical perspective on, on, on where this kind of unfolded so far. Thank you, Gail. Uh, just to, uh, just saying now, before I started, I was uh, before uh, I was making a comment about uh, upon the fact uh, that uh, obviously we have this story and the former trader from Jane Street arriving with um, nothing in Hong Kong uh, in 2019 within three years, a billionaire worth estimated at 15 billion dollars and celebrated in a whole series of magazines. Style Times, Forbes, and so on and so forth. And that tells us something too about the, how we, um, how much, um, you know, um, the public sphere and the media value these uh, um, uh, kind of uh, gets very rich, very quick template. Yeah, I, if I may, Alex and Gail, yeah. uh, nice to meet you, Gail. <laughs> Um, so, so, so the, um, um, the, the question, as you say, speculation of, of frenzy and so on and so forth, um, definitely seen it, I think, in the crypto markets sort of at large. Um, I would argue, though, that when it comes to FTX, um, the, the, real, uh, the real issue here is that uh, users who sign up with FTX are there, of course, because they want to trade the markets. Um, but their expectation is that they're doing this through a market infrastructure provider that is basically sound. Um, and that, has, that hasn't been the case. And you've seen that in some other failures where there are crypto custody providers who turn out to have a shambles of operations behind the scene. And um, so none of this, none of the assets are protected. Uh, and I think, I think, I think, the, so I think a distinction should be made between 
you know, what, what are we looking at? Are we here looking, looking at um, investors being friendly and not asking the questions about these market infrastructure providers? Or are they just basically access providers? Or, or, are, they, uh, um, or, or are they too trusting? Because, you know, it's just you, because they're basically leaning on on, you know, if I give this to JP Morgan uh, in the in or or, or to uh, State Street or whatever, then you know I, I I don't have to ask them. I can just trust the, the black box. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, my thinking would be the question would be here in um, to what extent this kind of fascination and crazy. Um, you know, not only encourages, but creates a, a situation uh, or contributes to creating situations where bad actors, scammers, to put it like this, um, have it much easier uh, than compared with a situation where we would not have such a frenzy. Well, that must be true. That must be I true. think that uh, that yeah. was um, one of the uh, 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 issues raised. Yeah. So uh, let me let me come to a final question, which I'd like to ask each one of you, and then uh, we can uh, switch to our, our uh, audience here. And the qu final question was: Do we see change in the wake of FTX in industry practices, legally and culturally? So, Ian. Um, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll have a go uh, first. Um, yeah, why do we humans and society keep making the same mistakes over and over again? Um, that's one thing <clears throat> that I've been thinking about. And perhaps it's connected to the last question, you know, greed. Um, people want to obviously increase their wealth. And is there any real way to get rich quick? That's what perhaps we've seen in some aspects of um, the investment industry in, into digital assets, that's, uh, you know, crypto um, assets as, a, <clears throat> as an alternative investment class. Um, and that's, you know, that's not really the case um, at all, um, in my experience. But the, the outcomes will clearly be additional focus at government level. So we know in the UK where I op operate um, and help government um, around advocacy and education is there will be a public consultation issued by His Majesty's Treasury in the next few weeks, specifically looking at additional regulation. Now, what type of regulation, whether it will be on the activity of custody, for example, whether it will be on the market participants, such as trading venues, exchanges, and so on and so forth, we don't know at this time. Um, but I suspect this has been largely sped up because of what happens in November FTX. Um, and that's just this jurisdiction. And then you look at the US, you know, we've had uh, that there's been some uh, commi Senate committee hearings in um, DC. We've had in the UK Treasury Select Committee hearings talking about this. You know, I gave evidence to one of these sessions myself a few weeks ago. Um, and then you have the intergovernmental standard setters also. Uh, FSB, Financial Stability Board, Bank of International Settlements, you know, sorry for all the acronyms, but these guys are the, you know, kind of groups that set uh, guidance um, at the inter-government, go governmental global level that then, you know, competent authorities or individual countries then transpose into their own law and regulations. So, yes, that that is in short, um, my response in the regulatory uh, space, and perhaps I'll pause then and, and, and let my colleagues um, on the panel talk about, you know, what, what the private sector industry is thinking about. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Lodovic. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, for sure, the, the, the governments need to respond because, the, you know, people have been damaged and, and uh, interests have been damaged, so you need to respond. And their interests have been damaged because of fraud. So, so that is a an, an, an enormous, uh, enormously powerful driver. Now, what is of course really, really hard to then decide is how are you going to regulate this? 
right? Um, the SEC is still even is still thinking it's a security if you take a protocol token like ETH or something like that, which which is it, it it I think they are the only ones, even in the US, who think that, right? So it's the CFTC and others are sitting there saying, oh, hang on a minute, this is not a security. This this is a commodity like asset. Now, why why am I banging on about that? Is because regulation is driven by the sort of asset that you handle for your client. So if you handle a commodity for your clients, it's a different type of regulator and a different type of impact than if you handle a security. Or indeed, if you are a payment service provider, it's different than if you are a, an exchange. So um, to settle that conceptual approach first is, is, is very important. And, and, and that will, I, I suspect, will slow things down still. Right. Um, um, uh, I, I'm now hesitating because I could go into some technicality further differences between AML, CFT, and securities regulation and, and other aspects. Um, what needs to happen ultimately is, is and, and I'm sure they will get there, is to treat these market infrastructure providers and services providers, be they brokers, be they exchanges, be they custodians, be they payment services uh, transfer agents. Um, to make sure that they that somebody is looking at it from an organizational systems and controls perspective, right? So that you get the basic protections in place, like okay, do you actually have the assets? Do you administer them properly? Do you have an auditor and all of these things? How exactly they're going to get there? That to me is still not entirely clear, and I don't envy the I don't envy the governments because. You know the question, and sorry, and I, I, I don't want to bang on too long. But one one thing, if I may say, one 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 aspect: every token is now is now equal in the eye of the regulator because they're not fully grasping the technology yet, right? Well, you know, a smart contract token that that basically works as a register, and therefore you get a registered chair, is something completely different from a protocol token that has intrinsic value because of utility and it's used in a completely different way. So all of these use cases for that technology and the different outcomes in the legal and regulatory sphere, we're only, at, only scratching at that, right? But what I will say is, thankfully, in a way, if, if I may say so, I mean, FTX has helped everybody in that respect, I think. Yeah. That way. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Vic. Uh, Gail. Yeah. So uh, they, they covered most of the, the, the legal and uh, regulatory elements that I would emphasize here in the US context. Uh, you know, what will actually get implemented, what will actually pass, and will it have teeth once it does? Those are all very open questions. So I guess what I would turn to. Um, uh, when I think about this, there are a couple of things, you know, one of the sort of major um, headline issues to come out of this, and one of the more sensationalistic headlines to come out of this, has well, I have several things. Um, one has been the, the campaign donations uh, that uh, SBF made, um, uh, largely through what is known here, through dark money channels, which uh, Sounds nefarious. It sometimes is nefarious. Sometimes it's not. That's just what we call it. Um, uh, and uh, you know, will this prompt any sorts of changes to that? Um, who knows? Uh, but it certainly has shown a light on the ways in which he was using um, that to influence politics in some pretty significant ways. Another is the way in which you know his whole effective altruism. Um, uh, I don't know what to call it, uh, uh, cover guy's plan was uh, uh, highly effective uh, as, a, as a mode of um, uh, putting himself out there as a philanthropist while also buying him a decent amount of cover for the public face that he had. Um, he got some major, uh, uh, I guess you would call them cultural voices of the left like Matt Iglesias to buy into it and blog about it and convince readers that this was good public policy, that this was the, the future face of philanthropy. Um, and uh, he even uh, 
this was kind of one of the smaller details that was that was often lost in the early days of FTS itself. But um, when they moved their headquarters to Chicago, they entered into a deal with uh, the mayor, with Lori Lightfoot in Chicago, to um, pilot this cash assistance program to uh, residents in poverty in um, uh, in the city, uh, where they would just uh, uh, give out cash, uh, I think it was 500 a month, to um, certain residents, see what they did with it, how it worked as uh, a program to lift people out of poverty. Now, you know, how much of that was sincere versus not sincere, those are kind of uh, secondary questions to the bigger question of like, how much was this um, a cover for a lot of what was going on behind the scenes? And the bigger sort of cultural question of how much of this was yet another um, episode of the American public's fascination and hagiography of this often young white male uh, computer nerd who can do magical, mystical things that we then just get enamored with and overlook a lot of what might be happening behind the scenes and don't really look into, uh, which in this case um, tended to be like even the least bit of scrutiny um, could have uh, could have uh, uncovered. I mean. The, the stories that came out about, you know, oh, well, actually, when he was pitching to some VCs, he was playing League of Legends, and, <laughs> and, uh, and someone, some found that disturbing. Those stories were out the day after it collapsed. So those stories were known, right? So like, why weren't those stories out there? Or the stories that, you know, someone tries to out him uh, for having been a crook, and oh, by the way, it was in a, it was in a news magazine uh, semaphore that he partially funded, right? How was this not put out along the way. Well, so, so I guess maybe one of the, this is less of an answer about regulation, about um, what the uh, uh, what SEC or SEC is, is, is gonna do about it, but more about maybe like investigative journalism, public perception, and um, uh, 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 maybe a, a general political acceptance of figures like him, because there will be a next one, is gonna be like, what level of scrutiny is someone like that gonna bear? Um, in the public eye, uh, if and when this this uh, the, the next version of this comes along, um, and what will they have to do to sort of dodge uh, exactly what it is um, that that I mean we, we see this you know, yet again with we have this new congressman George Santos who magically the day after he gets elected, three thousand different lies about his life come to light. Where were those two months ago? They were easily discoverable by Google, right? So, uh, so th this, this is kind of an ongoing saga and you kind of wonder how and why the passage of, uh, uh, was there. Yes, indeed, the similarity we have, or at least some parallel is George Santos with being a habitual, a habitual liar. And we had Boris Johnson in uh, here as well, and he seemed to be exactly this, a, a, uh, in many respects, a habitual liar. Um, um, these are inter very interesting to explore. Indeed, thank you very much, Gail. Now, uh, we, we are nearing the end of our conversation, but I would like to give you, uh, our audience uh, the opportunity to ask uh, any questions they might have. And uh, you can do this uh, either by raising your hand or by uh, typing uh, your question in our chat box. So since we, we had uh, this conversation uh, all the time, I am not going to to ask additional questions now. I've uh, I have intervened in the discussion, uh, but I, I do hope that uh, um, the audience might have uh, some questions. Well, for now, I. Um... I see I, a question, uh, Alex. Oh, yes, yes. Sorry, from Anna Roman. Sorry, I missed that. Anna. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, I can, yes. Okay. I'm working on a project right now surrounding the hype those figures like Elon Musk, SBF, Peter Thiel can take on, especially on social media. And I was interested to know, maybe Gail can speak more to this, how those communities um, reinforce those 
ideologies or reinforced that it's not looked into what goes on behind the scenes because everyone kind of loves them or follows what they say. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I've seen a variety of statistics about uh, uh, crypto uh, ownership and usage, uh, but we do know that it skews more heavily, it skews um, more uh, toward uh, uh, young men of color, uh, it skews more uh, uh, toward the younger generation, in, uh, generally speaking. Um, so, uh, you know, we know who the, the, the populations are who are trusting and investing in crypto. Uh, uh, we know who the faces are that crypto um, companies uh, put in their ads. So we know generally who they are, uh, who they're trying to appeal to. Um, there, there was a, 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 a really long series that um, one firm put out with Spike Lee uh, saying like, you know, this is the time to, to trust in crypto uh, dollars or dollars are for your grandpa's generation, et cetera. Um, so, uh, so right, there is kind of a, 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 a question of uh, uh, community socialization um, and normalization that goes along with um, uh, identity formation around crypto as um, a non-standard and against the norm uh, form of a, you know, monetary exchange uh, uh, currency or uh, even in the form of, of commerce itself, uh, when you think about it, um, the trading, uh, that comes with all the dangers that we know are associated with crypto, right? So, um, you know, S SBF had a, this sort of prophetic visionary uh, um, aura about him to many of his followers. Um, and it really took, um, uh, CZ to pop it uh, by, by saying like, I'll, I'll do the due diligence and I don't like what I see. Um, but, you know, again, like once that happened, it really was not that hard to see, at least by my understanding, I'm not a forensic accountant that the, the money was right there in another phone when it shouldn't have been, right? I mean, they were you know, barring, barring uh, using users assets to, uh, to make hedges um, is pretty much a no-no. So um, it, it should not have taken, I guess would be the short answer, it should not have taken the level of uh, hype deflation and uh, burst that it took. Thank you very much. Um, I, I hope, Anna, that uh, this answers your question. Uh, this yes. being said, thank you, uh, and thank you to the other speakers as well for the lovely panel discussion. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, as I don't see any other hands being raised here, so one last time, uh, if anyone uh, would like to raise any question. Uh, Alex, I see a question yes. in the uh, Q&A uh, chat. Oh, yes. Uh, so I have a question. We have a question from Parth, uh, namely, would the crash of FTX be beneficial to the crypto market as it would reduce the hype associated with crypto and would educate people on the topic and dangers? Let's let's go around, Ian. Uh, yes, um, with everything, no matter yeah how awful when folks have lost money, <clears throat> there's always a positive um and one could argue that at the moment we're starting to see um we have seen a shakeout this last uh six months or so similar to those that lived through the dot-com bubble um, um and in fact pretty much every single every single crypto lending um application centralized application not not a decentralized lending platform um have fallen over so that just kind of tells you everything you need to know lack of the right controls lack of the right risk mitigation processes um and perhaps a little bit of uh yeah over exuberance because of the hype so hopefully we'll start to see a, you know a little more um professionalization around some of these um activities thank you Lodovic. yeah i i agree it's it's never um 
great if uh, people lose money, <laughs> um, for sure. Um, but consider the alternative, right? If this had run for another six months in some bull market and it would have popped then, um, you know, or worse, it would have been like Bernie Madoff and it ran for 20 years, right? So, or 25, we don't know exactly how long he was active, but the, uh, uh, no, it's, it's I, I can't say it's a good thing, but it, I am happy that it happened relatively early on. And it also showed, uh, as, you, as Ian pointed out, the, uh, the cross liabilities and, and how people were just, you know, feeding themselves around in a, in a leveraged cycle of, of um, you know, that of, of, you know, got inf inflated the asset price beyond where it should be. Um, so, yes, I, uh, I, I think the question is spot on. Thank you. Gail? Yeah, I mean, I'd say the same. No one likes to see anyone lose money, but um, this had to happen at some point. I mean, there was no no way to sustain the, the inflationary run that uh, crypto was on, and uh, you know, there was no there was no grounding, there was no infrastructural footing for what um, for what crypto was doing. Um, it, it, it was interesting to me that it came right on the heels of. Uh, all the headlines, at least here in the U.S., being, look how crypto has been normalized. So the big, the big signal here was the Super Bowl ads. I don't know if this made international headlines, but there were all these Super Bowl ads here, which is kind of like Super Bowl ads are the, the, um, the most expensive ads, of course, that we have, but they're also the normalization. If you make a Super Bowl ad, like when when GoDaddy started running Super Bowl ads, that was a signal that you know even a silly a company as silly as GoDaddy had gone mainstream and was selling website domains through the Super Bowl, right? So with Super Bowl ads with Tom Brady, Matt Damon, Larry David, uh, pitching crypto um, and pitching FTX specifically, um, that was the signal that crypto was now purportedly safe, mainstream, as, as, as safe and tradable and normal as setting up an account with Charles Schwab. But in fact, it was really that was the tipping point to say, no, what that means is there are a bunch of crypto whales out there who need to unload so much of their crypto because they are so over leveraged, exactly what um, my colleagues here have been saying. And uh, in reality, that was, the, that was the signal that the bubble needed to burst. And right on the heels of that, it, it did. So um, maybe that was, the, as your question says, maybe that was the educational point and that was the takeaway from it. I uh, highly doubt we're going to see those ads again in Super Bowl in a couple of weeks this year. Um, so, so I think maybe that's, that's sort of the, the, the lesson and the takeaway from all of this. And the education was, you know, uh, an education in reverse. It reminds me, if I may, Alex, it reminds me, Gail just talks about, about the advertisement of um, JP Morgan. Uh, back in the 1920s, right? When when your hairdresser tells you buy, it's time to leave the market, right? So it was a little bit like that. <laughs> we uh, have uh, now at the very end two questions coming up. First, uh, I see on my screen Julie and then uh, Paula. Paula. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting panel. Um, I just wanted to um, ask a question based actually on what Gail was saying just now and um, that, that I guess the whole thing with FTX happened at the, um, the midst of this sort of what seemed like a rise and rise in the legitimization and normalization of um, crypto assets and um, I wonder where do we kind of go from here in the sense where do, where, where does, where do these kind of legitimization efforts go now? Is it, is it sort of possible to kind of overcome um, what happened with FTX in a sense? I don't know what the speakers might think about this. Yes, who would like to answer? Uh, I, I'm quite keen to answer that question. Uh, sure, please. Because <laughs> it's the question that I have in my head as well, in the sense that um, normalization is only it's only familiarization really, right? So it's like you're familiar with it, so it seems normal. But of course, we don't know, we don't know. There's two, there's two aspects to it, right? So there's one that's a technology per se, 
where you can tokenize off-chain assets and use Web3 to kind of move stuff around. Um, so, and that's happening and that's just the technology underpinning a new use of an old asset basically. Um, and then there is the, the tokens that are what I would call the protocol tokens. So that are the tokens that you need to instruct the chain, right? So if you want to do something on Ethereum, you need ETH to pay the ser for the service. Uh, any other blockchain will have its own protocol token and you need that. And the question, and when people think about crypto assets, that's what they think about that token. And what, you know, what, what will it be worth and where is it? Now, in my mind, that's ultimately going to be driven by how the changes are used because that it's a utilization, it's a, the utilization value of that token is the question. And so far we aren't there yet, right? I mean, the chains are used for all sorts of things, but it's sort of like experimental and no, nobody has a proper big solid business model plonked on the chain yet, underpinned by the chain. And I guess that's, that's where we're all waiting for and seeing where it's going. Thank you. Uh, Paula. Yeah, so very I'll, quickly. I'll add yeah. one thing to that. Um, I, I would echo a lot of that. I think, I think, that's, I think that's spot on. Um, I think uh, someone I've read a lot, uh, Matt Levine at Bloomberg Business, I think has, has dialed in a lot on this um, and has noted that uh, firms, major firms, so Fidelity has been moving pretty heavily into crypto, for example, um, have increasingly been interested in exactly what you're saying, the technology and the process more than the, um, uh, uh, the value. Um, and so thinking about mining, uh, mining crypto itself for what blockchain can yield, for um, what it can uh, otherwise do for other processes anywhere in the chain of banking, of uh, say mutual funds, of uh, of other derivatives, uh, et cetera, um, which may have very little to do with the highs and lows of Bitcoin, of Ethereum, of Dogecoin, of whatever. Um, so we could end up seeing, and this is highly speculative on my part, but we could end up seeing a, a real kind of interesting separation of the fluctuations in the values of, uh, of all sorts of uh, cryptocurrencies and the fluctuations in value, but likely raising in value of blockchain technology for mm -hmm. all sorts of purposes down the road, um, which may end up just kind of having a, a, a separation that, that, that might be, that might become too um, very, very tightly tied in a lot of ways, but independent things. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Paula, please. Yes, thank you for this interesting um, talk. And very, very quickly, um, we said that um, you know this case uh, has uh, been like a wake up call from you know the hype and the dreams of of, of uh, you know everything that we said. But we also know that um, hype is not necessarily always. Um, followed by you know coming back to reality but actually by um disappointment and which causes distrust and despair and fear uh which is also um as detrimental or and perhaps even more detrimental for markets for societies for economies than hype itself so you know we're <laughs> we've always had a difficult time you know disentangling this and handling this uh, uh you know in 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 other let's say uh, markets and and this becomes even more challenging considering the volatile and constantly evolving um uh, markets of, of of blockchain so how can we um you know deal with this considering also that governments are also doing steps back mm -hmm. and forward into regulating and on the other hand onto encouraging you know use cases and the introduction of of, of blockchain technologies in many sectors so yeah that was my question thank you so let's uh shall we take the reverse order now and start with gail and then Lodevic. that's a really interesting question right uh the, the the U.S. especially has never been known for um, uh, uh, using our governmental processes to get out front 
of technology, I mean, the, you know, our, if anything, uh, we're going to have the most antiquated systems possible to, to run any sort of governmental operation. So uh, other than the military, which starts to get a little bit scary, but like, <laughs> so um, I don't know, that's a really good question. And I don't know, um, yeah, that's, that, that, that's I, I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, it, I think private industry is probably going to get further out in front of it than uh, the government. And then the question will be like, what are the, what are the effects of currency regulation and currency trading going to be on the development of blockchain technology for, again, things that might be independent from the currency itself? That's a really good question. And, and, and I, that would be tough to speculate. Thank you. Ludovic? Yeah, it's, <laughs> I've, you know, I've been, um, I, I'm, I'm a financial regulatory lawyer by training, right? So I kind of look at, at this and with this very specific hat. Um, I, I find it quite fascinating to, to see um, how some governments think, ah, oh, we should run and, and facilitate this um, and have tried to do so. Um, but then still get stuck a little because it truly is a whole new technology that wasn't there, right? So it, it, it really, the Web3, you now can securely go peer to peer, whereas before you could only securely go to a website, basically to, to a centralized player, is, is, is mind boggling. And, and it's, everybody recognizes that, but to get out in front of that is, is really, really tricky. And that's, I think it's been borne out now um, because regulators have been, governments have been sitting on their hands a little. Um, I, I, um, I, you know, what people do realize is ultimately, if you really want adoption of these, this technology broadly, you need to facilitate the corporates and the, and the big institutions, right? And they're not coming in yet. I mean, some have been trying it with private chains, but that's kind of tedious, right? Because then, they, they, then it's whilst technology helpful there, but you 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 kind of you, you're kind of not doing this marvelous public facility that you used should be using, right? Um, so, in order to facilitate them coming in and have all the legacy businesses with all of their risk management and compliance and all these types sitting there. Uh, saying okay, it's okay, come in. You you need to you need to give some some certainty, and so it is a little bit of a chicken and egg, if that makes sense. So I'm not sure I'm answering the question well, but it's uh, it's it's well it's well put. <laughs> yeah. Indeed, I was go while you were you were developing the uh, the answer, uh, Lodovic. I was thinking, well, maybe CBDC will CBDCs will do something in this respect. All of this. See, these projects are a little bit further away, but then I thought, hmm, maybe not, because they are such a, you know, double-edged uh, sword, the CBDCs. Um, we, yes, Gail. I, I, I'd say, you know, it, it occurred to me as you said that, and funny, the thing that made me think of this was you're mentioning being a, a, a regulatory lawyer by training. Um, uh, SBF was... Um, uh, well known in in American, uh, if, if you follow politics, he was he was pretty decently known, especially once he made his big plays in the Democratic Party. Um, uh, he was known uh, for uh, being being the face of new crypto trading. You know, he had a, um, a, 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 an arena named after FTX, etc. Mm -hmm. um, few could have told you um, at the same time that most Americans could not uh, uh, use his product in the US uh, or do, do most of the things that, that, that his product um, uh, enabled in the US because of our, uh, you know, we, we would probably mostly think that like, oh, well, the US we've got this like free enterprise, you know, laissez-faire system, like no, right? uh, that, that most of the things that FTX enabled required doing, uh, using offshore capacities. Um, so I think there was a there was a real kind of a, a, a awakening moment, and that's part of what's prompted this spate of bills that are going forward and being considered now, and new regulatory procedures and policies that are being debated at this very moment. Is a real um, dissonance between what seemed like uh, a public face 
um, uh, young American crypto being normalized, even in supporting a, a major political party and there was effective altruism, et cetera. And the fact that like he couldn't even do that here. <laughs> so it was an odd, odd moment. Yeah. Well, I, I don't want to, we can definitely pursue this conversation further and further, but my feeling was that behind the scenes, not necessarily in public, behind the scenes, there was a battle, um, or at least a cause, uh, intense competition, which firm should obtain a license for dealing crypto in the US? Is it going to be FTX or is it going to be Binance? And there was an active, um, you know, or at least active attempts to you know prevent the competitor from uh, from getting that that is the feeling that uh, that one gets that uh, while uh, they were prevented from dealing uh, crypto offering their products in the aos they were not very far not all too far from that moment when they'll be able to do that i on binance i will say though and um uh, um uh, uh, cz he has managed to, um, he's very clever for sure, and um, very experienced relative to the other players. Um, but he has created this kind of sprawling complex of, of connected companies around the world. There is no regulator uh, in a main jurisdiction will allow that to play. It's, it's I guess, that, 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 you know, you, you're almost inviting an, uh, an, an FDX Mark II situation uh, uh, risk from a risk perspective. Um, yeah, sorry, I had to kind of uh, make that call. I, I, I would be careful with Binance as well uh, in terms of putting your funds in or, uh, I, you know, yeah. nobody's looking at that either from the inside, other than CZ, with a small group of people. Yeah. Just a final ethnographic anecdote. In 2019, uh, I was in Tokyo at that, in September. At that moment, I, I wanted to interview someone from Binance for, So together with a Japanese colleague, we started looking first for the office, Binance's offices in Tokyo, because they um, they were claiming they are present uh, in Tokyo. They active in. We couldn't find them. It um, we searched and searched and searched and couldn't find that. It was just not not possible. So on this uh, final note, uh, let me thank you very much for being here, especially Lodovic and Gail for being here with us today. I've personally learned a lot from, uh, from the conversation. Deepest apologies, Gail, for my uh, mix up of time zones. It's entirely my fault and exclusively my fault. And I'd like to thank the audience for being here with uh, us. And uh, we are going to come back to our seminar series on the 8th of February when we will have Koray Kaliskan uh, from the New School talking about the collapse of trust in a trust machine. Um, these webinars are recorded. Uh, when we started, uh, I mentioned that and I asked for permission. And they are uploaded on our website uh, at the FinWork Center. You can access them then. We have past webinars uploaded there. This being said, thank you very much, everyone. Especially Lodevic, Ian, who has already left, and Gay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. <laughs>